Section 11. Lines Written in the Bay of Lerici She left me at the silent time when the moon had ceased to climb the azure path of heaven's steep, and like an albatross asleep, balanced on her wings of light, hovered in the purple night, ere she sought her ocean nest in the chambers of the west. She left me, and I stayed alone, thinking over every tone which, though silent to the ear, the enchanted heart could hear, like notes which die when born, but still haunt the echoes of the hill, and feeling ever, oh, too much, the soft vibration of her touch, as if her gentle hand even now lightly trembled on my brow. And thus, although she absent were, memory gave me all of her that even fancy dares to claim. Her presence had made weak and tame all passions, and I lived alone in the time which is our own. The past and future were forgot, as they had been and would be not. But soon the guardian angel gone, the demon reassumed his throne in my faint heart. I dare not speak my thoughts, but thus disturbed and weak, I sat and saw the vessels glide over the ocean bright and wide, like spirit-winged chariots sent o'er some serenest element for ministrations strange and far, as if to some Elysian star sailed for drink to medicine such sweet and bitter pain as mine. And the wind that winged their flight from the land came fresh and light, and the scent of winged flowers and the coolness of the hours of dew and sweet warmth left by day were scattered o'er the twinkling bay. And the fisher with his lamp and spear about the low rock's damp crept and struck the fish which came to worship the delusive flame. Too happy they, whose pleasure sought extinguishes all sense and thought of the regret that pleasure leaves, destroying life alone, not peace. End of section 11. Lines written in the Bay of Lerici by Percy Bysshe Shelley. Section 12. Love's Philosophy. The fountains mingle with the river, and the rivers with the ocean. The winds of heaven mix forever with a sweet emotion. Nothing in the world is single. All things by a law divine in another's being mingle. Why not I with thine? See, the mountains kiss high heaven, and the waves clasp one another. No sister flower could be forgiven if it disdained its brother. And the sunlight clasps the earth, and the moonbeams kiss the sea. What are all these kissings worth, if thou kiss not me? End of section 12, Love's Philosophy by Percy Bysshe Shelley. Section 13, Mont Blanc. Lines written in the Vale of Chamonix The everlasting universe of things flows through the mind and rolls its rapid waves, now dark, now glittering, now reflecting gloom, now lending splendor, where from secret springs the source of human thought its tribute brings of waters, with a sound but half its own such as a feeble brook will oft assume in the wild woods among the mountains lone, where waterfalls around it leap forever, where woods and winds contend, and a vast river over its rocks ceaselessly bursts and raves. Thus thou, ravine of Arve, dark, deep ravine, thou many-colored, many-voiced vale, over whose pines and crags and caverns sail fast cloud-shadows and sunbeams, 
awful scene where power in likeness of the arve comes down from the ice gulfs that gird his secret throne bursting through these dark mountains like the flame of lightning through the tempest thou dost lie thy giant brood of pines around thee clinging children of elder time in whose devotion the chainless winds still come and ever came to drink their odors and their mighty swinging to hear an old and solemn harmony thine earthly rainbows stretched across the sweep of the ethereal waterfall whose veil robes some unsculptured image the strange sleep which when the voices of the desert fail wraps all in its own deep eternity thy caverns echoing to the arve's commotion a loud lone sound no other sound can tame thou art pervaded with that ceaseless motion thou art the path of that unresting sound dizzy ravine and when i gaze on thee i seem as in a trance sublime and strange to muse on my own separate fantasy my own my human mind which passively now renders and receives vast influencings holding an unremitting interchange with the clear universe of things around one legion of wild thoughts whose wandering wings now float above thy darkness and now rest where that or thou art no unbidden guest in the still cave of the witch poesy seeking among the shadows that pass by ghosts of all things that are some shade of thee some phantom some faint image till the breast from which they fled recalls them thou art there some say that gleams of a remoter world visit the soul in sleep that death is slumber and that its shapes the busy thoughts outnumber of those who wake and live i look on high has some unknown omnipotence unfurled the veil of life and death or do i lie in dream and does the mightier world of sleep spread far and round and inaccessibly its circles for the very spirit fails driven like a homeless cloud from steep to steep that vanishes among the viewless gales far far above piercing the infinite sky mont blanc appears still snowy and serene its subject mountains their unearthly forms pile around it ice and rock broad veils between of frozen floods unfathomable deeps blue as the overhanging heaven that spread and wind among the accumulated steeps a desert peopled by the storms alone save when the eagle brings some hunter's bone and the wolf tracks her there how hideously its shapes are heaped around rude bare and high ghastly and scarred and riven is this the scene where the old earthquake demon taught her young ruin were these their toys or did a sea of fire envelop once this silent snow none can reply all seems eternal now the wilderness has a mysterious tongue which teaches awful doubt or faith so mild so solemn so serene that man may be but for such faith with nature reconciled thou hast a voice great mountain to repeal large codes of fraud and woe not understood by all but which the wise and great and good interpret or make felt or deeply feel the fields the lakes the forests and the streams ocean and all the living things that dwell within the daedal earth lightning and rain earthquake and fiery flood and hurricane the torpor of the year when feeble dreams visit the hidden buds or dreamless sleep 
holds every future leaf and flower, the bound with which from that detested trance they leap. The works and ways of man, their death and birth, and that of him, and all that his may be, all things that move and breathe with toil and sound, are born and die, revolve, subside, and swell. Power dwells apart in its tranquillity, remote, serene, and inaccessible, and this the naked countenance of earth on which I gaze, even these primeval mountains teach the adverting mind. The glaciers creep like snakes that watch their prey from their far fountains, slow rolling on. There many a precipice, frost and the sun, in scorn of mortal power have piled. Dome, pyramid, and pinnacle, a city of death, distinct with many a tower and wall impregnable of beaming ice. Yet not a city, but a flood of ruin is there, that from the boundaries of the sky rolls its perpetual stream. Vast pines are strewing its destined path, or in the mangled soil branchless and shattered stand. The rocks drawn down from yon remotest waste have overthrown the limits of the dead and living world, never to be reclaimed. The dwelling place of insects, beasts, and birds becomes its spoil, their food and their retreat forever gone, so much of life and joy is lost. The race of man flies far in dread. His work and dwelling vanish like smoke before the tempest stream, and their place is not known. Below vast caves shine in the rushing torrent's restless gleam, which from those secret chasms in tumult welling meet in the vale and one majestic river, the breath and blood of distant lands forever rolls its loud waters to the ocean waves, breathes its swift vapors to the circling air. Mont Blanc yet gleams on high. The power is there, the still and solemn power of many sights and many sounds, and much of life and death. In the calm darkness of the moonless nights, in the lone glare of day, the snows descend upon that mountain. None beholds them there, nor when the flakes burn in the sinking sun, or the star-beams dart through them. Winds contend silently there, and heap the snow with breath, rapid and strong, but silently. Its home, the voiceless lightning in these solitudes, keeps innocently, and like vapor broods over the snow. The secret strength of things which governs thought, and to the infinite dome of heaven is as a law, inhabits thee. And what wert thou, and earth, and stars, and sea, if to the human mind's imaginings, silence and solitude, were vacancy? End of section 13, Mont Blanc, by Percy Bysshe Shelley. Section 14, To Night. Swiftly walk o'er the western waves, spirit of night. Out of the misty eastern cave, where all the long and lone daylight Thou wovest dreams of joy and fear, which make thee terrible and dear, Swift be thy flight. Wrap thy form in a mantle gray, star inwrought, Blind with thine hair the eyes of day, Kiss her until she be wearied out, Then wander o'er city and sea and land, touching all with thine opiate wand. Come, long sought. When I arose and saw the dawn, I sighed for thee. When light rode high and the dew was gone, and noon lay heavy on flower and tree, and the weary day turned to his rest, lingering like an unloved guest, I sighed for thee. Thy brother Death came and cried, Wouldst thou me? Thy sweet child sleep, the filmy-eyed, 
murmured like a noontide bee shall i nestle near thy side wouldst thou me and i replied no not thee death will come when thou art dead soon too soon sleep will come when thou art fled of neither would i ask the boon i asked of thee beloved night swift be thine approaching flight come soon soon end of section fourteen to night by percy bysshe shelley section fifteen of shelley selected poems and prose this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Section 15. Letter to Maria Gisborne. The spider spreads her webs, whether she be in poet's tower, cellar, or barn, or tree. The silkworm in the dark green mulberry leaves, his winding sheet and cradle ever weaves so i a thing whom moralists call worm sit spinning still round this decaying form from the fine threads of rare and subtle thought no net of words in garish colours wrought to catch the idle buzzers of the day but a soft cell where when that fades away memory may clothe in wings my living name and feed it with the asphodels of fame which in those hearts which must remember me grow, making love an immortality. Whoever should behold me now, I wist, would think I were a mighty mechanist, bent with sublime Archimedean art, to breathe a soul into the iron heart of some machine portentous or strange gen, which by the force of figured spells might win its way over the sea and sport therein for round the walls are hung dread engines such as vulcan never wrought for jove to clutch ixion or the titan or the quick wit of that man of god saint dominic to convince atheist turk or heretic or those in philanthropic council met who thought to pay some interest for the debt they owed to jesus christ for their salvation by giving a faint foretaste of damnation to Shakespeare, Sidney, Spencer, and the rest, who made our land an island of the blest, when lamp-like Spain, who now relooms her fire on freedom's hearth, grew dim with empire, with thumbscrews, wheels, with tooth and spike and jag, which fishers found under the utmost crag of Cornwall and the storm-encompassed isles, where to the sky the rude sea rarely smiles, unless in treacherous wrath, as on the morn when the exulting elements in scorn, satiated with destroyed destruction, lay sleeping in beauty on their mangled prey as panthers sleep, and other strange and dread magical forms the brick floor overspread. Proteus transformed to metal did not make more figures or more strange, nor did he take such shapes of unintelligible brass, or heap himself in such a horrid mass of tin and iron not to be understood, and forms of unimaginable wood, to puzzle Tubal Cain and all his brood. Great screws and cones and wheels and grooved blocks, the elements of what will stand the shocks of wave and wind and time. Upon the table more knacks and quips there be than I am able to cataloguize in this verse of mine. A pretty bowl of wood, not full of wine, but quicksilver, that dew which the gnomes drink, when at their subterranean toil they swink, pledging the demons of the earthquake, who reply to them in lava, cry halloo, and call out to the cities o'er their head, roofs, towers, and shrines, the dying and the dead, crash through the chinks of earth, and then all quaff another rouse, and hold their sides, and laugh. This quicksilver no gnome has drunk, within the walnut bowl it lies, veined and thin, in color like the wake of light that stains the Tuscan deep, when from the moist moon rains the inmost shower of its white fire, 
the breeze is still, blue heaven smiles over the pale seas. And in this bowl of quicksilver, for I yield to the impulse of an infancy outlasting manhood, I have made to float a rude idealism of a paper boat, a hollow screw with cogs. Henry will know the thing I mean and laugh at me. If so, he fears not I should do more mischief. Next, lie bills and calculations much perplexed, with steamboats, frigates, and machinery quaint, traced over them in blue and yellow paint. Then comes a range of mathematical instruments for plans nautical and statical, a heap of rosin, a queer broken glass with ink in it, a china cup that was what it will never be again, I think, a thing from which sweet lips were wont to drink the liquor doctors rail at, and which I will quaff in spite of them, and when we die we'll toss up who died first of drinking tea, and cry out, heads or tails, wherever we be. Near that a dusty paint-box, some odd hooks, a half-burnt match, an ivory block, three books, where conic sections, spherics, logarithms, to great Laplace, from Saunderson and Sims, lie heaped in their harmonious disarray of figures, disentangle them who may. Baron de Tott's memoirs beside them lie, and some odd volumes of old chemistry, near those a most inexplicable thing, with lead in the middle, I'm conjecturing how to make Henry understand, but no, I'll leave, as Spencer says, with many mo, the secret in the pregnant womb of time, too vast a matter for so weak a rhyme. And here, like some weird archimage, sit I, plotting dark spells and devilish enginery, the self-impelling steam-wheels of the mind, which pump up oaths from clergymen, and grind the gentle spirit of our meek reviews into a powdery foam of salt abuse, ruffling the ocean of their self-content. I sit, and smile or sigh, as is my bent, but not for them. Libetcho rushes round with an inconstant and an idle sound. I heed him more than them. The thunder-smoke is gathering on the mountains, like a cloak folded athwart their shoulders, broad and bare. The ripe corn under the undulating air undulates like an ocean, and the vines are trembling wide in all their trellised lines. The murmur of the awakening sea doth fill the empty pauses of the blast, the hill looks hoary through the white electric rain, and from the glens beyond, in sullen strain, the interrupted thunder howls. Above, one chasm of heaven smiles like the eye of love on the unquiet world. While such things are, how could one worth your friendship heed the war of worms? The shriek of the world's carrion jays, their censure, or their wonder, or their praise. You are not here. The quaint which memory sees in vacant chairs your absent images, and points where once you sat, and now should be, but are not, I demand if ever we shall meet as then we met. And she replies, veiling in awe her second-sighted eyes, I know the past alone, but summon home my sister Hope. She speaks of all to come. But I, an old diviner who knew well every false verse of that sweet oracle, turned to the sad enchantress once again, and sought a respite from my gentle pain, inciting every passage o'er and o'er of our communion, how on the seashore we watched the ocean and the sky together, under the roof of blue Italian weather, how I ran home through last year's thunderstorm, and felt the transverse lightning linger warm upon my cheek, and how we often made feasts for each other, where good will outweighed the frugal luxury of our country cheer, as well it might, were it less firm and clear than ours must ever be, and how we spun a shroud of talk to hide us from the sun of this familiar life, which seems to be but is not, 
or is but quaint mockery of all we would believe, and sadly blame the jarring and inexplicable frame of this wrong world, and then anatomize the purposes and thoughts of men whose eyes were closed in distant years, or widely guess the issue of the earth's great business, when we shall be as we no longer are, like babbling gossip safe, who hear the war of winds and sigh, but tremble not, or how you listen to some interrupted flow of visionary rhyme, in joy and pain struck from the inmost fountains of my brain, with little skill, perhaps, or how we sought those deepest wells of passion or of thought, wrought by wise poets in the waste of years, staining their sacred waters with our tears quenching a thirst ever to be renewed. Or how I, wisest lady, then endued the language of a land which now is free, and winged with thoughts of truth and majesty, flits round the tyrant's sceptre like a cloud, and bursts the peopled prisons, and cries aloud, My name is Legion! That majestic tongue, which called her on, over the desert flung of ages and of nations, and which found an echo in our hearts, and with the sound startled oblivion. Thou wert then to me, as is a nurse, when inarticulately a child would talk as its grown parents do. If living winds the rapid clouds pursue, if hawks chase doves through the ethereal way, huntsmen the innocent deer, and beasts their prey? Why should not we rouse with the spirit's blast out of the forest of the pathless past these recollected pleasures? You are now in London, that great sea whose ebb and flow at once is deaf and loud, and on the shore vomits its wrecks, and still howls on for more. Yet in its depth what treasures! You will see that which was Godwin, greater none than he, though fallen, and fallen on evil times, to stand among the spirits of our age and land before the dread tribunal of to come, the foremost, while rebuke cowers pale and dumb. You will see Coleridge, he who sits obscure in the exceeding luster and the pure intense irradiation of a mind, which with its own internal lightning blind flags wearily through darkness and despair, a cloud-encircled meteor of the air, a hooded eagle among blinking owls. You will see Hunt, one of those happy souls which are the salt of the earth, and without whom this world would smell like what it is, a tomb. Who is what others seem, his room, no doubt, is still adorned with many a cast from shout, with graceful flowers tastefully placed about, and coronals of bay from ribbons hung, and brighter wreaths in neat disorder flung, the gifts of the most learned among some dozens of female friends, sisters-in-law, and cousins. And there is he with his eternal puns, which beat the dullest brain for smiles, like duns thundering for money at a poet's door. <laughs> Alas, it is no use to say, I'm poor, or oft in graver mood when he will look things wiser than were ever read in book, except in Shakespeare's wisest tenderness. You will see Hogg, and I cannot express his virtues, though I know that they are great, because he locks, then barricades the gate within which they inhabit, of his wit and wisdom you will cry out when you are bit. He is a pearl within an oyster-shell, one of the richest of the deep. And there is English peacock, with his mountain fair turned into a flamingo, that shy bird that gleams in the Indian air. Have you not heard, when a man marries, dies, or turns Hindu, his best friends hear no more of him? But you will see him and will like him, too, I hope, with the milk-white Snowdonian antelope matched with this cameleopard. His fine wit makes such a wound 
the knife is lost in it. A strain too learned for a shallow age, too wise for selfish bigots. Let his page, which charms the chosen spirits of the time, fold itself up for the serener clime of years to come, and find its recompense in that just expectation. Wit and sense, virtue and human knowledge, all that might make this dull world a business of delight, are all combined in Horace Smith. And these, with some exceptions, which I need not tease your patience by descanting on, are all you and I know in London. I recall my thoughts, and bid you look upon the night. As water does a sponge, so the moonlight fills the void, hollow, universal air. What see you? Unpavilioned heaven is fair, whether the moon, into her chamber gone, leaves midnight to the golden stars, or wan climbs with diminished beams the azure steep, or whether clouds sail o'er the inverse deep, piloted by the many wandering blast, and the rare stars rush through them dim and fast. All this is beautiful in every land. But what see you beside? A shabby stand of hackney coaches, a brick house or wall fencing some lonely court, white with the scrawl of our unhappy politics. Or worse, a wretched woman reeling by, whose curse, mixed with the watchman's, partner of her trade, you must accept in place of serenade, or yellow-haired Polonia murmuring to Henry some unutterable thing. I see a chaos of green leaves and fruit built round dark caverns, even to the root of the living stems that feed them, in whose bowers there sleep in their dark dew the folded flowers. Beyond, the surface of the unsickled corn trembles not in the slumbering air, and born in circles quaint and ever-changing dance, like winged stars the fireflies flash and glance, pale in the open moonshine, but each one under the dark trees seems a little sun, a meteor tamed, a fixed star gone astray from the silver regions of the Milky Way. Afar the contadino's song is heard, rude but made sweet by distance, and a bird which cannot be the nightingale, and yet I know none else that sings so sweet as it at this late hour, and then all is still. Now, Italy or London, which you will. Next winter you must pass with me. I'll have my house by that time turned into a grave of dead despondence and low-thoughted care, and all the dreams which our tormentors are. Oh, that Hunt, Hog, Peacock, and Smith were there, with everything belonging to them fair! We will have books, Spanish, Italian, Greek, and ask one week to make another week as like his father, as I'm unlike mine, which is not his fault, as you may divine. Though we eat little flesh and drink no wine, yet let's be merry. We'll have tea and toast, custards for supper, and an endless host of syllabubs and jellies and mince pies, and other such ladylike luxuries, feasting on which we will philosophize, and we'll have fires out of the Grand Duke's wood to thaw the six weeks' winter in our blood. And then we'll talk. What shall we talk about? Oh, there are themes enough for many about of thought-entangled descant, as to nerves, with cones and parallelograms and curves, I've sworn to strangle them if once they dare to bother me when you are with me there. And they shall never more sip laudanum from Helicon or Himeros. Well, come, and in despite of God and of the devil, we'll make our friendly philosophic revel outlast the leafless time, till buds and flowers warn the obscure inevitable hours sweet meeting by sad parting to renew to-morrow to fresh woods and pastures new end of section fifteen letter to maria gisborne by percy bysshe shelley section sixteen 
time long past. Like the ghost of a dear friend dead is time long past, a tone which is now forever fled, a hope which is now forever past, a love so sweet it could not last, was time long past. There were sweet dreams in the night of time long past, and was it sadness or delight, each day a shadow onward cast, which made us wish it yet might last, that time long past. There is regret, almost remorse, for time long past. Tis like a child's beloved course a father watches, till at last beauty is like remembrance, cast from time long past. End of section 16. Time Long Past by Percy Bysshe Shelley. Section 17. When the Lamp is Shattered. When the lamp is shattered, the light in the dust lies dead. When the cloud is scattered, the rainbow's glory is shed. When the lute is broken, sweet tones are remembered not. When the lips have spoken, loved accents are soon forgot. As music and splendor survive not the lamp and the lute, the heart's echoes render no song when the spirit is mute. No song but sad dirges, like the wind through a ruined cell, or the mournful surges that ring the dead seaman's knell. When hearts have once mingled, love first leaves the well-built nest. The weak one is singled to endure what it once possessed. O love who bewailest the frailty of all things here, why choose you the frailest for your cradle, your home, and your beer? Its passions will rock thee as the storms rock the ravens on high. Bright reason will mock thee like the sun from a wintry sky. From thy nest every rafter will rot, and thine eagle home leave thee naked to laughter. When leaves fall and cold winds come. End of section 17 when the Lamp is Shattered by Percy B. Shelley Section 18 Dedication of the Revolt of Islam There is no danger to a man that knows what life and death is. There's not any law exceeds his knowledge, neither is it lawful that he should stoop to any other law. Chapman To Mary so now my summer task is ended, Mary, and I return to thee mine own heart's home. As to his queen, some victor knight a fairy, earning bright spoils for her enchanted dome, nor thou disdain that ere my fame become a star among the stars of mortal night, if it indeed may cleave its natal gloom, its doubtful promise thus I would unite with thy beloved name thou child of love and light. The toil which stole from thee so many an hour is ended, and the fruit is at thy feet. No longer where the woods to frame a bower with interlaced branches mix and meet, or where with sound like many voices sweet waterfalls leap among wild islands green, which framed for my lone boat a lone retreat of moss-grown trees and weeds, shall I be seen, but beside thee, where still my heart has ever been. Thoughts of great deeds were mine, dear friend, when first the clouds which wrap this world from youth did pass. I do remember well the hour which burst my spirit's sleep. A fresh made on it was, when I walked forth upon the glittering grass, and wept, I knew not why, until there rose from the near schoolroom voices that, alas, 
were but one echo from a world of woes, the harsh and grating strife of tyrants and of foes. And then I clasped my hands and looked around, but none was near to mock my streaming eyes, which poured their warm drops on the sunny ground. So without shame I spake, I will be wise and just and free and mild, if in me lies such power, for I grow weary to behold the selfish and the strong still tyrannize without reproach or check. I then controlled my tears, my heart grew calm, and I was meek and bold. And from that hour did I with earnest thought heap knowledge from forbidden minds of lore, yet nothing that my tyrants knew or taught I cared to learn, but from that secret store wrought linked armor for my soul before it might walk forth to war among mankind. Thus power and hope were strengthened more and more within me, till there came upon my mind a sense of loneliness, a thirst with which I pined. Alas, that love should be a blight and snare to those who seek all sympathies in one. Such once I sought in vain, then black despair, the shadow of a starless night, was thrown over the world in which I moved alone. Yet never found I one not false to me, hard hearts and cold, like weights of icy stone which crushed and withered mine, that could not be aught but a lifeless clog, until revived by thee. Thou friend, whose presence on my wintry heart fell like bright spring upon some herbless plain, how beautiful and calm and free thou wert in thy young wisdom, when the mortal chain of custom thou didst burst and rend in twain, and walked as free as light the clouds among, which many an envious slave then breathed in vain from his dim dungeon and my spirit sprung to meet thee from the woes which had begirt it long. No more alone through the world's wilderness, although I trod the paths of high intent, I journeyed now. No more companionless, where solitude is like despair, I went. There is the wisdom of a stern content, when poverty can blight the just and good, when infamy dares mock the innocent, and cherished friends turn with the multitude to trample. This was ours, and we unshaken stood. Now has descended a serener hour, and with inconstant fortune friends return. Though suffering leaves the knowledge and the power which says, Let scorn be not repaid with scorn and from thy side two gentle babes are born to fill our home with smiles, and thus are we most fortunate beneath life's beaming morn, and these delights and thou have been to me the parents of the song I consecrate to thee. Is it that now my inexperienced fingers but strike the prelude of a loftier strain, or must the lyre on which my spirit lingers soon pause in silence, ne'er to sound again, though it might shake the anarch custom's reign, and charm the minds of men to truth's own sway holier than was Amphion's? I would fain reply in hope, but I am worn away, and death and love are yet contending for their prey. And what art thou? I know, but dare not speak. Time may interpret to his silent years. Yet in the paleness of thy thoughtful cheek, And in the light thine ample forehead wears, And in thy sweetest smiles, and in thy tears, And in thy gentle speech, A prophecy is whispered To subdue my fondest fears. 
and through thine eyes even in thy soul i see a lamp of vestal fire burning internally they say that thou wert lovely from thy birth of glorious parents thou aspiring child i wonder not for one then left this earth whose life was like a setting planet mild which clothed thee in the radiance undefiled of its departing glory still her fame shines on thee through the tempest dark and wild which shake these latter days and thou canst claim the shelter from thy sire of an immortal name one voice came forth from many a mighty spirit which was the echo of three thousand years and the tumultuous world stood mute to hear it as some lone man who in a desert hears the music of his home unwanted fears fell on the pale oppressors of our race and faith and custom and low-thoughted cares like thunder-stricken dragons for a space left the torn human heart their food and dwelling-place truth's deathless voice pauses among mankind if there must be no response to my cry if men must rise and stamp with fury blind on his pure name who loves them thou and i sweet friend can look from our tranquillity like lamps into the world's tempestuous night two tranquil stars while clouds are passing by which wrap them from the foundering seaman's sight that burn from year to year with unextinguished light End of section 18 Dedication of the Revolt of Islam by Percy Bysshe Shelley Section 19 With a Guitar to Jane Ariel to Miranda Take this slave of music for the sake of him who is the slave of thee, and teach it all the harmony in which thou canst, and only thou, make the delighted spirit glow till joy denies itself again and too intense is turned to pain for by permission and command of thine own prince ferdinand poor ariel sends this silent token of more than ever can be spoken your guardian spirit ariel who from life to life must still pursue your happiness or thus alone can Ariel ever find his own. From Prospero's enchanted cell, as the mighty verses tell, to the throne of Naples he lit you o'er the trackless sea, flitting on your prow before like a living meteor. When you die, the silent moon in her interlunar swoon is not sadder in her cell than deserted Ariel. When you live again on earth, like an unseen star of birth, Ariel guides you o'er the sea of life from your nativity. Many changes have been run since Ferdinand and you begun your course of love, and Ariel still has tracked your steps and served your will. Now, in humbler, happier lot, this is all remembered not, and now, alas, the poor sprite is imprisoned for some fault of his in a body like a grave from you he only dares to crave for his service and his sorrow a smile to-day a song to-morrow the artist who this idol wrought to echo all harmonious thought felled a tree while on the steep the woods were in their winter sleep rocked in that repose divine on the wind-swept apennine and dreaming some of autumn past and some of spring approaching fast and some of april buds and showers and some of songs in july bowers and all of love and so this tree oh that such our death may be died in sleep and felt no pain to live in happier form again, from which beneath heaven's fairest star 
the artist wrought this loved guitar, and taught it justly to reply to all who questioned skillfully in language gentle as thine own, whispering an enamoured tone sweet oracles of woods and dells and summer winds and sylvan cells, for it had learned all harmonies of the plains and of the skies, of the forests and the mountains and the many-voiced fountains, the clearest echoes of the hills, the softest notes of falling rills, the melodies of birds and bees, the murmuring of summer seas, and pattering rain, and breathing dew, and airs of evening. And it knew that seldom heard mysterious sound, which driven on its diurnal round as it floats through boundless day, our world enkindles on its way. All this it knows, but will not tell to those who cannot question well the spirit that inhabits it. It talks according to the wit of its companions, and no more is heard than has been felt before by those who tempt it to betray these secrets of an elder day. But sweetly as its answers will flatter hands of perfect skill, it keeps its highest, holiest tone for our beloved Jane alone. End of section 19 with a guitar to Jane by Percy Bysshe Shelley Section 20 2 One word is too often profaned One word is too often profaned for me to profane it One feeling too falsely disdained for thee to disdain it one hope is too like despair for prudence to smother, and pity from thee more dear than that from another. I can give not what men call love, but wilt thou accept not the worship the heart lifts above, and the heavens reject not, the desire of the moth for the star, of the night for the morrow, the devotion to something afar from the sphere of our sorrow. End of section 20. 2. One word is too often profaned by Percy Bysshe Shelley.